to get rid of things that hold us back from walking into that victory fully and completely. It's so important. We've been um, coming from the approach of the ministry gifts, um, and I just wanted to read that verse to you again from Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach and be the unity in faith and to the, the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So important. That's the ministry gifts that God has placed in his body. And, you know, when Pastor Harley and I um, were born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, we knew God had called us to ministry. And throughout the years, um, I was his helpmate, basically. It, it, he was traveling the world with, with Dr. Sumrall for a few years, and, and I was homeschooling my children. And it worked out that way that, you know, I knew how to support Harley the best I could anyway. And then when we knew that we were drawn here to Fort Wayne to minister, I knew that role would, would shift a bit, and I was kind of uh, uneasy about it for myself anyway. We went to a, a church... A friend, a pastor friend of ours in, in Michigan, and he had um, Reverend Mark Barclay as the, the guest speaker that night. And God uses Pastor Mark Barclay as as an apostle and also very prophetically. And he prayed for Pastor and I after the service was over. And first of all, he just looked at me and he said, "Ah, yes, Mother out of Zion, you're a mother out of Zion." And instantly I knew I could live with that. I was a mom. I homeschooled my children. I I, I spent 24-7 with them, okay? I knew how to mom. And I I thought, you know what, Lord? I can do this. So today I'm going to minister to you as a co-pastor, a shepherd, and a mom. Because moms, moms want to help their children grow. And mature. And, and as a Christian mom, we want our children to grow in the things of God, to grow into maturity in the knowledge of, of all that God is for them. And sometimes we use a little bit of tough love. And I know sometimes you look at me and you say, oh, but she's so sweet. <laughs> if you talk to my children, they'll give you another story. <laughs> so today I may get a little tough on you because I love you. And I want to see you walk, as Greg said, in the fullness of the victory that God has planned for you. So, the, the, the message today is called Wounds to Curses and Reverses. So those first two words are kind of, ugh, but reverses, that's what we're going for today. Amen. Now I have a little story to start out with. And it's a good one. I think it, I think we can all relate to it. And I'll just read it to you. It says, this little boy, he, it's against his parents' strict orders. A little boy was sliding on his wood floors at home without his socks. A splinter lodged in his foot. He tried to ignore it, but after several days of hobbling, his mother demanded he slip his sock off. There she saw the truth. She gingerly pulled the splinter out, and he began his healing process. And the question is, do you have a splinter in your foot? Now, I think we all know what a splinter is and how painful that can be. We have bushes out behind our deck that carry thorns on them, and um, every summer, if I weed around them or whatever thorns get into my fingers and they're so painful and they're hard to get out and for you know several hours until I can finally work it out it's just sitting there and I get so upset with those bushes but they're very pretty 
So we can all identify with having had a splinter at one time or another. And, and this little boy, you know, he knew he had been disobedient, sliding across the wood floors. He knew what his parents had talked about, why they had told him, don't go sliding on those wood floors without socks on your feet. So he was afraid to go to his mom and show her. Instead, he decided, you know what? I'm just going to keep it to myself. I'm not going to tell her I disobeyed her. I can deal with this. I'll just let it go. I'll ignore it. So he put his socks on and tried to ignore that splinter. But splinters generally, if they're ignored, and especially on a foot where you put a lot of pressure on it every day, they can get infected. And probably this little boy's splinter got infected. And several days later, the mother noticed he just wasn't doing well. He wasn't his normal self. He wasn't bouncing all over the place, you know, being as active as normal little boys are. And so probably when he he put pressure on that foot, maybe he winced, you know, like every time he stepped on that foot, trying to deal with it himself. And so she demanded to see it. And when she took his sock off, she saw the truth. Now it says she gingerly pulled the splinter out. Because by that time, probably it was puffy and red all around the area of the splinter. And maybe there was pus in that puffiness because it had been infected. But she pulled it out. It probably hurt while she was pulling it out. But once it was out, it was on the way to recovery, total healing. And the little boy learned a lesson through it all. But for you and me... Those splinters that we're talking about can be wounds, relationship wounds. And they can come in many different ways, many causes. But what we're going to look at today is why it's so important to deal with that, to get those wounds healed, to get that splinter out of there so that you can be on your route to fullness, completeness, wholeness, And accept and walk in and run in and share in the victory that God has for you. Now, a relationship wound can come through many avenues. One of them, a biggie, is rejection. And probably each and every one of us can relate to that in in one way or another. But when we've trusted someone, when, when we've looked to someone as our support or our strength, we've shared with them, we think that we love them, or even, even on the job, when, when we've, we've got a job that we really enjoy and, and those around us are doing well, you know, and, and we just, this is where I belong, and something happens. And we're fired, or we're turned in for something, or lied about, or in a marriage, you know, where the marriage breaks up, we're rejected, and that wound comes against us. We feel it. It's a strong wound, rejection. Another wound that can come is from sexual abuse, and it's a predominant one. It's horrible. But it's there, and it comes against us. I can remember years ago, we, we lived here, but um, it was shortly after we moved here. We had, um, I had a noon women's cell at the time for women who basically were older women, and they didn't want to come out after dark, and so they came to my noon cell. And after some of them left, we were at the kitchen table sitting and talking, and there were four of us, three women at plus myself, and it the subject just came up for whatever reason, and all three of those women had been sexually abused early in life. And at the time, I was shocked, but I've come to realize over the years just how predominant that, that wound is, that, that action is. And then there's manipulation. Who wants to be manipulated, right? Who enjoys that? And yet people can manipulate us. And and wounds can can come up through that. 
and deception. That's another one. We've opened ourselves up to someone maybe. We've, we've shared. We've thought they were genuine with us. And then we, we find out they just lied. They just wanted something and they've left. They deceived us. So you may be walking around with a splinter in your foot. But the question is, will you continue to act as though it's not there? Or will you let God shine on his light on that wound and put it on the road to healing? Because once you let God shine his light on it, then he can help you walk and get that thing healed quickly, very quickly sometimes. So we're going to look first of all at how people deal wrongly with a wound. And from that, hopefully we all decide there's not going to be a wound that's going to stay put in my body. No matter how painful I'm afraid it's going to be to deal with it, I understand it's not going to stay in my body. I, I no longer want it there. So too often, people harbor and protect their wound. Or like this little boy, they think they can handle it themselves, hide it from others. And, and you know, when we harbor that wound, it's like we're just cuddling it, pampering it, saying, oh, poor thing. You know, this wound, it hurts so bad. And what does that do? That makes us think even more evil of the person who caused it in the first place. We've been going through the the book by Andrew Womack in our cell lesson. And one of the things in this this particular book is you got to lift up Jesus above all else. You got to focus on him, exalt him, and everything else that comes against you will fall to the side. It'll get smaller and smaller because your magnifying the greatness of Jesus in your life. Well, if you've got a wound and you're magnifying it, Jesus can't help. It's so important that we lift up Jesus and see him as our healer, as our source of strength, and let that wound be healed. One of the examples, and I'm just going to, read a little bit of this, is right in the very beginning. It deals with the very first child born on this earth, Cain, and the very second child born on this earth, Abel. And that's found in Genesis 4, 1 through 15. Now, Abel, let's see here. Okay. First, okay, I'll just start out. Adam lay with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, 
Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. And then the Lord put a mark on Cain. The very first child ever born on this earth turned against the very second child born on this earth, Cain and Abel. And instead of simply saying, God, what would it take to please you? Cain became angry. God didn't accept his offering. He was so pleased with Abel's offering, and he got angry at Abel. So he rose up and he killed him. These examples in the Bible are really good because, you know, they're, they're examples of men and women who lived, and, and the way they lived teaches us how to or not to live. Another example is from um, 1 Samuel 18, 6 through 9, and it's a Saul. Now, we know David was anointed to be king as a, as a young man, a, a boy almost. God an, anointed him to be king, but he wouldn't be king until the time was right. And he, his brothers were fighting with, with Saul, and they were stalled at this pass where the Philistines that they were fighting against had a giant. And he, every day, came out against Israel and taunted them and basically mocked their God. And every day he would come out and he'd say, you know, send somebody out. And if, if they kill me, then the Philistines will be your slaves. If I kill him, however... You'll be slaves of the Philistines. And so the Israelites were petrified. And they hid behind anything they could find to hide behind whenever the giant came out to taunt them. Well, David came at his father's request to to see how his brothers were doing. And he took some food supplies for his brothers and the commanders over his brothers. And when he heard Goliath taunting the Israelites and mocking his God, it was It was too much for him. He couldn't handle it because he loved God and he knew how faithful God had been for him. And so he went to the king and offered to kill Goliath. And the king was shocked but allowed him to do it. And he went out and made the proclamation that in his his God's power, Goliath would die. And he, he swung the, the slingshot. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, he slung that swing, slingshot and it, it killed Goliath. And he chopped off Goliath's head. So Saul was really excited about that. And he wanted to take David home with him. He was, he was just in amazement that a young person like this would do that. And so at that point... They come into the city, and David is with him. First Samuel eighteen six through nine. Uh, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and and lutes. As they danced, they sang. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. 
They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can can he what more can he give but the kingdom? Get but the kingdom. And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. So he became jealous of David. Both of these men pampered their their wound. They they thought about how wounded they were and they opened the door to bitterness that's the next step they get bitter they open that door to bitterness by concentrating on how painful the wound was and how unfair it was that this happened to them and remember God told Cain That sin is crouching at the door. Like a lion. And and you've all seen pictures of lions getting ready to pounce on an animal. And, you know, our cat, Sophie, a feline. (laughs) When she's outside, if she she has a target, if she sees a chipmunk, for instance, nibbling on something, she'll get down as low as she can to the ground. You know, and every part of her body is tense, and she's just getting ready to pounce. And when when it's the right time, she just, boom, you know, flies out there and pounces. Usually the chipmunk gets away. Sometimes it doesn't, but <laughs> I have to pray. <laughs> but that's that's how our defeated foe is. You know, he, he, he crouches like a lion. Satan wants to get you bitter. So that he can have access to your heart. Now, why does he want access to your heart? Well, because he doesn't want the plans and the purposes that God has for your life to come to pass. So he uses this, this, this way of doing things, tries, you know, tries to magnify that wound in your eyes, in your, in your mind tries to get you to think about how painful it is. And as you're thinking about that, you think, how could that person hurt me like that? Cain probably thought, how could Abel do this to me? I'm his big brother. And yet God favors him? That's not right. And Saul was jealous and couldn't couldn't handle the idea that, that a young boy was getting more, you know, glory than he was. But as God told Cain, and he tells us, bitterness is a choice. We can either choose to deal with that wound as soon as it happens to us. That splinter, as soon as that boy got the splinter, he could have chosen to go to his mother. And she would have pulled it out and it would have been fast and painless. But we can also choose to hold on to that wound, to think about it. And to allow bitterness to take hold. Cain could have gone to God and said, I'm sorry, Lord. I see that Abel's offering was much more pleasing. How how can I gather an offering for you that you'll be pleased with the next time? So that I can please you also. Because, Lord, that's all I really want to do. It's, it's please you. He could have done that. Saul could have rejoiced. You know, here's David, a young, vital, energetic man, excited about the things of God. And, 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 you know, Saul made the promise that anybody who defeated Goliath would, would be able to marry his daughter, Michael. So he would have a son-in-law in David. He could rejoice in that. He could, um, see it as an opportunity to pour into David, to share with David what he he had learned as king. And besides that, he could enjoy the grandchildren that, that David provided him. I mean, it could be a really good thing. And then, when the time was right, he could transition the kingship over to David and enjoy his retirement with his grandchildren. 
It wasn't that way, was it? And then in, in the New Testament, you know, we, we see what happened to Judas. He had a choice. He betrayed Jesus. But, you know, Peter, he denied him three times. But Peter couldn't stand it and realized that he had denied his, his Lord and repented. And it was painful for Peter, but Jesus fully forgave him. Jesus would have fully forgiven Judas had he simply repented. But he had allowed that hatred, that just the, the striving for power and, and denying the Lord as, as Lord to the point where he couldn't turn back. And so he killed himself. So each one of these men opened the door to bitterness. And that bitterness festered and grew. And you know, that's what what bitterness does. It's like an infection. When that little boy's splinter was in his foot for over a day, it started to be infected. That's how bitterness is. It touches every part of our lives if we allow it to take root in us and fester and grow. And then the next step is that they made a vow. Oftentimes when people are are being now taken over almost by bitterness, they make vows. Cain made an inward vow that he was going to get even with Abel. This kind of vow is when you come up with a plan to get even. It's not the kind of vow that you take when you get married. That's a good vow. It's the kind of vow that you look at that person and you can't stand them. You're on the, the very brink of hating them. And you say, I will handle this. I'm going to deal with that person. I'm getting even. It's a vow of judgment. You're judging that person. Now, you can judge actions of people. The Bible says, you know, you see somebody and you can judge if they're good actions or evil actions. But we don't judge that person. That's in God's hands. And so when we're making a vow to get even, it's like we're judging that person. And we're, we're taking we're taking over God's job. So Cain vowed that he was going to get even with Abel. And he did. He killed him. Saul planned, if, if you look in the Bible, there are 11 chapters that talk about Saul and, and the plans he had to kill David. When a door becomes a vow... The wound has moved from our heart to our head. And we fixate on it. We're obsessed with it until we ultimately accomplish it. Now, we may not necessarily go out and murder the person that hurt us. But, you know, in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, Jesus makes some things clear. He says, you have heard that it was said to the people um, long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin, but anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So how we feel in our heart towards someone, the Lord knows, and he sees it as murder. So as children of God, it's very important that we understand. It's the word that we go to to get our direction. It's the word of God that is truth for us. We we are not sitting in the world taking in the advice of the world. We are in God's kingdom and we use his word 
to guide us. And his word says, don't hate others. Because in my eyes, that's murder. So it's very important that we understand this. And number four, they came under a curse. And we can see that. Cain killed his brother and God cursed the ground for the rest of his life. He was a farmer. He loved to, to you know, work in the soil. And now it became next to impossible for him to do that. Saul came under a curse for pursuing David to kill him. He fell on his own sword ultimately. But during, during the rest of his life, he was plagued because he just couldn't get thoughts of jealousy and hatred out of his mind towards David. One moment he would be loving him, talking. The next moment he would be trying to kill him. He was fixated on getting even with him. And, of course, we know that Judas likewise came under that curse, and he killed himself. So it's so important to realize how dangerous it is when we're wounded, you know, and, and many of us are. We're human beings. We live in a world that's full of sin. And people hurt us. And generally, they're the people closest to us. You know, parents get a divorce and, and it hurts us as a child. They didn't mean to hurt us, but sometimes depending on how old we are and and what our personality is like, it hurts really bad. Children say disrespectful things or, or do things that hurt themselves, but it also hurts us. But what we do with that wound is what's so important. Do we hold on to it? Do we come under all of these categories? Or are we going to let the Lord deal with it and get rid of it? Heal it for us. Are we willing to do that? Because we can't grow any further in the things of God if we hang on to that wound. If we pamper, spoil that wound. We set other things aside. And and just like that little boy, when we're wounded, it affects our whole life. There are times when the Lord will say, I would like you to do such and such. And we say, okay, okay. And all of a sudden we realize, oh, I, no, I, I can't do that. What if, what if that person hurts me too? What, what if I'm rejected? I, no, I, I can't do that. It holds us back from all that God has for us. If we want to grow up and live in victory, we need to recognize if we have that, that wound and understand the potential damage that wound will do. And yield to the Lord. So. How do you reverse the curse? And this is the point where we choose to receive help. In complete healing of the wound. That has been directing our lives. Because it has. That little boy had to hobble. And he was an active little boy probably. Hobbling it just doesn't suit little boys. We need to be ready to grow up. So the first point is, accept those who wounded you. Now, I know that sounds outrageous, especially if it just happened. But it's so important. Again, we do things the way the Bible instructs us to. And I know sometimes if we're not used to following the word of God, It's hard to see what the word of God is saying compared to what we're used to doing. It's just completely foreign to us. But it's so important that we begin to recognize that that's where our victory truly lies. So in Matthew 5, 44 and 45, the Bible says, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
that you may be sons of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. You know, sometimes we look at somebody who's hurt us and we say, how can they get blessed? How can, how can they look so happy and have so many things? They did this to me. Well, because the sun rises on them as well as it does on us. But the point is, we need to be free from that hurt, that feeling that says, how can that happen to them? We need to pray for them. We need to love them. We need to accept those who have wounded us. And you know, it's so important. If they wounded you by rejecting you, and that's what, you know, the wound that you're, you're feeling from them, if you, op- you act in the opposite spirit towards them and start to include them, reach out to them, then you're refusing to get on their level. People who, who have a spirit, and it is a spirit of rejection, act like magnets to other people. And you can pick it up, you know, if you're around somebody who's, who's full of rejection. Because you're, you feel like rejecting them too. You, you look at them and you, uh, uh, you know, either they say something that's just undesirable or they, they look a certain way or they act a certain way and you just don't want to have anything to do with them. A lot of times that's a spirit of rejection. And it acts, you know, like a magnet when you, you try to put two magnets together and they, they're just, mm, you can't do it. You know, they push apart. But instead, if we accept them, if we allow the love of Jesus in our lives to flow to them, that's one of the steps of overcoming that rejection in us and towards them. When Jesus, who is our example, was tempted in the wilderness, he refused to get on Satan's level. In other words, arguing what Satan was tempting him with. You know, just getting on Satan's level and, you know. Instead, what did Jesus do? He simply quoted the word of God three times and that was it. Satan left. The Bible says for a more convenient time. But Satan had had it up to here with the truth and couldn't handle it. That's our example. When we want to deal with something that's hurt us and we know it's holding us back spiritually, we go to the word of God. We find scripture that deals with it and we obey that. We walk the love walk with them. We understand that when we do that, God is on our side. He's backing his word. And, you know, how can you not overcome when it's God who's on your side? The the creator of the heavens and the earth on your side, backing you with his word, standing firm with you. So it's very important that you deal with these wounds according to what the word of God directs us. Number two, forgive them at the cross. So you accept those who wounded you, you forgive them. Another example in the Old Testament is Joseph. His brothers sold him into slavery because they were jealous of him. And he spent the rest of his life in Egypt, but not his whole life in slavery. Because he forgave his brothers. Now, He didn't trust them. And it shows when they did come to him, he realized he had to prove that he could trust them as well. But he did forgive them, and it opened the door for him then to be blessed and to rise up to the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. So bring that terrible wound to the place where Jesus died as wounded for our transgressions. The word of God says when Jesus hung on that cross, 
he looked out at the multitude and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was after those who had followed him. Many of them had had turned against him. They were shouting along with the Romans, crucify him, crucify him. He forgave them. He's our example. And then thirdly, reject every vow. Vows made in judgment hurt us as much as they do the person we've judged. And I don't know if you've ever heard somebody just angrily saying, I will never do that. I will never be like him. You know, sometimes as a young person, if if you've had a difficult family relationship and 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 I just you know I I I was a caseworker years ago and and I've worked with people and I've heard this before young people saying I will never be like my father because he was an alcoholic and he was mean and when he got drunk he took it out on me and I will never be like that that's a vow being made in anger and in judgment To get even, basically, with his father. Unfortunately, what happens many times is that comes back upon that person who made that vow. And they become alcoholics. And they take it out on their families. So it's so important to understand that and deal with things like that. If you've you've been like that, just speak out against it. Come against it and say, I release that. I release the person, I forgive that person, and I I just release that person in Jesus' name. I forgive them. Speak it out loud because then you've got that out there instead of those angry words that you spoke the last time over that person. Paul says to cast down imaginations. What he's talking about are those vain imaginations. When you're thinking thoughts against that person. It's not godly thoughts. It doesn't exalt Jesus. What it does is exalt lies against God, essentially. Those are vain imaginations. When we're, we're thinking about things that, that are opposite to the knowledge of God, to who God is. That's the kind of imaginations we cast down. Do it in faith, and the feelings will follow. So often I've heard people say, I can't forgive them. I just, I I can't. Well, obey the word of God, whether you feel it or not. Because feelings will always lie to you if you let them. If you're used to caving into your feelings, it'll take, it'll take you standing firm and saying, no, I'm not gonna feel sorry for myself. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna immediately think about how that wound hurt me. I'm just, I'm done with that. I'm going to be faithful to God's word and do what his word says. He said, forgive them. So I'm going to forgive them. And as you do that, then your feelings eventually will follow. Number four, bless instead of curse. And again, as you pray for them, you know, you start to, God starts to show you. He starts to change you first of all, but he also starts to show you things about that person. That suddenly this compassion rises up in you that you thought, how could I feel compassion for them after they did this to me? But when you do things God's way, things like that happen for you. Bless instead of curse. Speak a blessing upon the person who wounded you. As difficult as it is, what you're doing is removing the poison and the power that that wound has over you when you bless them. When the mother pulled that splinter out, it hurt. But then it was gone, and and all of the infection could 
could work its way out. That's what happens when we bless instead of when we're cursing, when we're, we're saying evil about that person, when we're imagining evil things about them. We're just adding to the poison. That bitterness is just growing and festering in our bodies. But when we bless them and pray over them and bless them by speaking God's truth over them, that infection is oozing out of us. That bitterness goes. And in its place, love can come into us for them. So, slip your sock down. Jesus loves you. And he knows the pain that you've had through that wound. The Bible says that when he was here on earth, he was tempted in every way like we are. And the Bible also says that he is ever interceding now on our behalf. Ask for his forgiveness and release your offender. Walk without hobbling the rest of your life because that wound will be healed. Now, why is that so important? This is the mother coming out, speaking to you. (laughs) God doesn't want you hurting. He doesn't want you hobbling around with a festering wound. He sent Jesus to provide wholeness and healing for you so that you can be all that God created you to be and do all the things that he desires you to do. You can't do any of that if you're you're hobbling around with, with a wound. But you can when, when you release that. Ephesians 1, 3 says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Everything you need to walk into the victory that he has for you, he already has blessed you with. You receive the blessings from the spiritual realm into manifestation to you by faith. So stretch your faith out there and receive what you need. It's already yours. He's provided for your victory. We just need to receive it. And we can when we're not hobbling around, pulled down, suffering from wounds. So don't allow the defeated foe to steal what belongs to you. It's yours through Jesus and the grace of God. Forgive and let go. So that the healing can be manifested. Grow up because there are so many others who need you. They need you. They need the love of Jesus that's in you. They need your strength. They need to see that you are strong and that you're not backing away from helping them. And that you have a source of strength that they also need. They need joy. And they need peace. So many people look at you and they say, wow, how can that person be so peaceful? Well, it certainly isn't what's around us, but it's his peace in us that gives us peace that we can share with others. So, so important. Now, I do have, there's some... a flyer in your bulletins. If you didn't get one, there's some sheets on the back table there about an upcoming fast that Lou Engel has proclaimed. He's um, prophetic and he's a prayer warrior um, and felt led of God to proclaim an Esther fast from this Wednesday night through Saturday night. Um, and Purim starts on Saturday, the, the Jewish 
holiday of Purim, which celebrates the, the, the protection that God provided for Israelites, Jewish people, when Esther was queen. And Haman came against all Jews and wanted to kill them all. And Mordecai, Esther's uncle, came to her and asked her to fast and or asked her to deal, you know, to speak to the king. And, and her way to do that was to fast, first of all, and then to go speak to the king. And when she did, the king agreed with her and the Jews were protected and those who came against the Jews were were killed. And there's a similarity there that Lou Engel picked up on with, with the days that we're living in. And so if you feel led to join us in fasting and praying, a key element there, and one of the, the things that I, I appreciate about fasting simply is the time that it gives me to pray, where I'm rushing around trying to fix a meal, do this, that. I don't have to. I can, I can spend time praying and seeking God. So if you feel led, I'm not going to proclaim a fast here. I'm just going to say it's something that we can do. We can fast and pray. The nation needs us. You know, it's not over. We now have the opportunity to rise up as the body of Christ and proclaim the strength of God in us. And sometimes fasting is such a good way to just show us who God is on the inside of us, that we don't need to fear, but we have a holy God living in us and directing our lives and speaking to us and through us. So the fast again Wednesday sundown through Saturday sundown. Um, and like I said, it's in the bulletin or it's back at the table.